Good Thursday morning, seniors. Today we are coming to the third and fourth of our values of contemporary culture. Uh, yesterday, we began with the first two, individualism and consumerism. Today, we're going to look at two that are also interconnected, briefly on scientism, that I think is one that is less significant than it was, let's say, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and another one which is probably even more significant, the power of technology. So let's uh, begin in prayer, and then let's look at those two values. Father and God, uh, as we live in this world that uh, now has become so dependent on technology to have have school, to have relationship with each other during our time of uh, social distancing. Father, I give you thanks for the science, the technology that enables us to, to continue to live even as we protect ourselves. But Father, help us to never trust so much in the power of our knowledge and the power of our technology and the work of our hands that we fail to acknowledge you, the creator, of our fine bright minds the creator of a creation a world that is consistent that is trustworthy and father most of all that you place us in relationships that we can reflect your love and compassion and mercy be with us today father and open our eyes to ways in which we can honor you in the name and for the sake of jesus we pray amen all right, scientism, to begin here with a brief definition here. Scientism is the belief, the idea that the natural, the natural science is the most authoritative worldview, superior to all other interpretations. Uh, again, go with science. Why would you trust religion? Why would you trust your intuition? Why would you trust anything other than the cold, hard facts that have been ascertained through observation and analysis and cold, hard logic and, and data? All right. Now, again, I uh, don't don't hear me questioning science. I think science has a profound place, but I want you to again go back and think through the difference in the way that natural philosophy worked under this gentleman Aristotle, and the way that science works today. Under Aristotle, uh, natural philosophy, the philosophy, the a word of wisdom about nature, sought knowledge of the way that things actually are in and of themselves by considering their causes, considering what moved them, considering what material they were made of, considering what their final purpose was, considering what form they were found in. And this enabled you to know its place in the world and to be able to, again, construct a world of logic and order, all right? To know the thing, to know it completely. Modern science tends to want to know how things work. They focus on that efficient cause or that moving cause, and also a bit on the material cause because the material obviously is in chemical or is in the amount of uh, potential energy in, in it because of its position means something as far as what it will do, how it will move, how it will be affected. And again, a great, wonderful goal is to use this knowledge to our betterment, to relieve and comfort all humanity. Those are good things, but it is a smaller view than the world of the ancients. And what does it actually do? It ends up in a sense objectifying reality, creating it as if it were simply a cold, hard thing that could be manipulated in however we wish without implications for its purpose, for its meaning, and especially its meaning in a world created by God, a world in which we were given authority to step in, to use it to bless one another, yes, okay, we agree with science, but also to honor God. And again, I want to keep saying this was not at the beginning. Isaac Newton was a, a, a believer in a divine, divine creator. It was not a plan to move God off to the side. It became that because of its idea. Remember this phrase, ideas have consequences. 
but bad, ill-formed ideas have victims. And as we begin to use nature, to use the creation in ways without thinking about its ends, about its purposes, we end up with pollution. We end up with a cosmos which in a sense is rebelling back against us. Read your Romans 8, the very creation groans in eager expectation of its redemption. I'm not a physicist, but certainly I think this reveals one interesting thing about science. Science is always heard in the context of a story, all right? And yeah, if we can't solve it, oftentimes we come up with a story. No purpose to that, just your amusement. If you didn't get a chance to finish it, you can stop the video and go back and look at it. Second of our values is technology. I'll move this over here. Uh, this was a gentleman, Jacques Ellul, a French uh, sociologist, a strong believer, who uh, comes up with an argument we'll look at here in a second. Here's his phrase, that which desacralizes a given reality, that's which makes it no longer holy, sacred, authoritative, in itself becomes the new sacred reality. That is, I, I would argue that I would use the term authority. That which becomes authoritative within a culture, that's what uh, replaces another old authority, becomes the authority which cannot be questioned. He uses a couple of examples here in technological society that in the Middle Ages, the church was seen as a source of meaning and significance. Uh, if you want to construct a society, if you want to have justice and fairness, the church is the one who steps out and works out issues between individuals. If you want to have a consistent uh, social structure, the church is the one that recognizes infants by baptizing them and bringing them into the society. They're the ones which recognizes weddings recognizes this covenant relationship between two individuals. They're the ones which recognizes the, the terrible tragedy of death and yet the hope for the future. They are the one which communicates meaning. And in the Reformation, Martin Luther, without intending to, ends up in a sense replacing the church with scripture. Now, again, I don't know what else he could have done. He saw a church which was not, uh, w which was reacting badly to the culture around it. All right, it had become more interested in raising money. It was using uh, opportunities to make money through selling of indulgences. The indulgences were being misunderstood. But the Reformation ends up saying, no, no, we're going to go back to the Bible. But in so doing, the church went, Yes, and it became much more of a relationship later on of me and Jesus, we have our own thing going, right? Who needs the church? That is problematic. Again, the, the pendulum swing, the pendulum swing. So the Reformation, the church becomes a source of order. And in this time of the individual, here we go, the individual in a sense going to scripture and finding reality, finding truth, never in buried, it's, it's, it's absolute, it's outside of them but you find it as an individual, we begin looking at the cosmos around us and individuals begin to find that truth individually. And the scientific revolution begins and science begins to replace scripture. As old understandings, okay, the earth centered, sun rotating around it, becomes replaced by a scientific view, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, 
and and then later on thinkers i.e lyle didn't talk a lot about darwin others come along to say wait here's another understanding scripture is going to be put over here as a matter for private study but truth is found in science the scientism today as scientism is on the way you notice how we're talking a lot about the covid uh situation social distancing in terms of science can you trust the science do scientists know they're making predictions how can they know all right that now technique i.e technology is going to be authoritative if we can find the right masks if we can find the immunization if we can create a social structure a medical structure if we can a research way in which doing this okay technique assisted made possible by technology is going to be the way that we're going to fight our way through this notice the change here from church to scripture more individualistic to science now outside of faith but rather subjective and now to technique technology where in a sense we're not focused on the thing at all but the process fascinating change to me uh and again <laughs> I've talked in class. What are you without your cell phone? Technology, in a sense, has become our reality, our authority. There's a thinker who just challenges me in this, a fellow named Neil Postman, passed away a few years ago. Uh, people believe that technology works, they rely on it, it makes promises, they're bereft sad us torn when they're denied access to it that they're delighted when they're in its presence that for most people it works in mysterious ways think of how many people just got to have that newest cell phone and how many are just sort of fascinated look at how it works they condemn people who speak against it Ooh. they stand in awe of it and then also in the born again mode they will alter their lifestyles their schedules their habits their relationships to accommodate Technology becomes the means through which they interact with the world. This is from a book, The End of Education. Any of you who are thinking about going into education and teaching? Fascinating book. Uh, dated as far as its time, but again, when you deal with ideas, ideas don't go out of fashion. Okay, ideas are either true or false. Uh, I'll have to look up the Wicker Man old story. Postman in his book, uh, Tech, in his book, Technopoly, uh, Technopoly, the rule of the polos, okay, the techno, the city of technology, argues that there are three major things that happen when technology becomes the center of a culture. Number one, there will be some who have knowledge monopolies, i.e. Google. All right. Perhaps being Microsoft, Apple, iPhone, Samsung. Okay, there are going to be some, particularly let's go with that Google, the ones who control access to information. They are going to be the ones that end up ruling allowing information to come to us without us being aware again i don't i don't think it's an evil plot but it is a consequence of technology number two information glut we have too much again there's an old joke a man with one watch always knows what time it is a man with two is never sure and with the information glut we just are not sure which to trust and which to not and then Last of all, because of all the information, because of the access to all these moving and meaningful stories that are tossed out without context, we lose the significance of cultural and religious symbols. Postman writes this about Brave New World. It's Huxley remarks, civil libertarians, and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny 
fail to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distraction. We don't have time or interest in parsing through this. And I can understand, I don't have time or interest either, but we must be aware. And Postman, here in a 1990 lecture, basically argues in another spot that all technologies are not add-ons. They don't simply add on more information, more ability, more, but actually they are cultural changers. I don't know about you, have you ever tried to use an abacus? I'm not very good at it. Now, maybe having calculators and computers is great, but it made an abacus step out of the way. What about driving stick shift? All right. Let's go on, go on to these quick cartoons. So maybe you next year. My question, how much learning is going on in this context? As T.S. Eliot wrote, we are distracted from our distractions by distractions. And Calvin and Hobbes has a particularly appropriate one for our time. I'll let you read it. Never get back time. And closing thoughts here. Postman in a lecture at Calvin College in the 90s listed seven questions you ought to ask about technology. I've called it down to three. Uh, first question, what problem is this technology purporting to solve? He uh, tells about trying to buy a car in which he could not buy a car without cruise control. He lived in New York City. His opportunity to use cruise control were non-existent. He didn't need it, yet you could not get a car without cruise control. Whose problem is it? He didn't need it. And yet, because of the power of technology, all cars came with cruise control. And last of all, critical important, are there other problems that might be created? Are there problems of carbons? With the wonderful invention of the automobile internal combustion engine, does it create problems? Should we have seen that coming? Should we have seen perhaps that our attention spans would be shortened by the advent of these technologies? Brother, one last thought here. Technology even cut touches and colors our most reflective moments. See you at two o'clock. Don't forget your current event is due this evening. Check capstone. Have a good afternoon. See you.